Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Today, we have a new dose of revenge stories for you to enjoy. Subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Sit comfortably. Here we go with our first story. Measure wrong and blame it on the customer? Prepare to lose a six-figure client. This isn't my revenge, but my builders from about 15 years ago when they were building my house. The architect for our house was insistent on sash windows, and the only maintenance-free sash windows that were available in my country at the time were only available from one manufacturer. Now, this manufacturer had a very stuck-up and slippery sales rep who insisted on doing all the measurements himself, including the custom bay window. This rep also dropped a couple of demo windows to show off, and he left them with our builders on site for a few weeks. If you're not familiar, brick construction in the UK comprises of an inner cinder block wall and an external wall, creating a cavity for insulation. This becomes important later. The windows turn up on the construction site, and the builders get round to fitting them. All of them go in fine, apart from the bay window. It didn't fit. This absolute pillock had measured the internal cinder block and not the external brick. This meant the window was slightly small. My PO'd builder phones the sales rep and tells him that the window is the wrong size and they need to supply a new one. Sales rep turns into an a-hole and blames our builder, saying he supplied the wrong dimension. Their arguing goes back and forth, but sales rep doesn't budge. Our builder had no other choice than to buy another window since all the other windows were paid for and fitted at this point. These windows were expensive, and the builder was very PO'd. Now this is where the revenge comes in. At this point, the sales rep still hadn't collected his demo window, and our builder wanted revenge on this slimy sales rep. Our builder gets some silicone bathroom sealant, opens the demo windows, and fills them full of the stuff then closing the window, basically gluing this window shut. The sales rep eventually collects the demo window so he can show off to potential clients. One of the selling points of these windows were that you could open them with one finger. So now imagine the sales rep in front of a potential customer failing to open this window with one finger. Now imagine the sales rep trying to open the window with all his strength and it's still not opening. Karma served. PO'd sales rep eventually works out the builder sealed the window shut. He then rings up our builder, screaming at him, going on about how he just lost a 450,000 pound contract to supply the windows to a new building development. The builders at this point were in hysterics and the butthurt sales rep threatens to sue them. They never got a word off the sales rep in the end. Moral of the story, own up to your mistakes. So delicious. Short-sighted, little-minded people are the worst. And our next story. The money's nice, but the look on new management's faces was priceless. I've generalized every aspect of this story to keep it anonymous. Anyways, I work in software development using very in-demand and complex frameworks and tools. The average salary doing what I do in my area is around $110,000 a year for a relatively simple, low-level job. By this, I mean a position where the employee does not have major responsibilities, works as part of a much larger team, etc. I worked on-site and then remotely as a contractor for three years for a company hereafter named The Company while I was at university. As a contractor, I was the only developer in the entire company of a few hundred people and was solely responsible for all systems, development, testing, etc. This includes databases, web servers, and much more. This seems like a lot. It was but I had full control of my environment and autonomy. I worked on the software projects that I wanted to and felt would have the most impact. During that period of remote work, upper management was changed. After I completed my schooling, I received an offer from the company for $70,000. I knew this was below what I should be making, but I also realized the following. I had full autonomy in my environment. I had some gaps in my skill set. By staying in this environment, I could fill in those gaps and very easily prepare to transition to another, higher-paying job. So new management and I reached an agreement. I would accept a salary of $72,000, and then after six months' time, we would meet to go over my salary, and it would be increased by at least 
This was included in my offer letter, which both new management and I signed. Fast forward to six months later. I've now filled every gap in my skill set and expanded on it to increase my skill set even more. The six-month marker rolls by and nothing happens. I send new management repeated meeting requests and they're ignored. Three weeks into the sixth month, I go to HR and raise the issue. HR turns ghost white and makes the meeting happen. That afternoon, new management comes into my office and offers me a 1% raise. Yes, that's correct. 1%. I kept my cool though and reminded them that I was guaranteed at least 15% due per our agreement. New management completely denied making this agreement and repeated their previous offer. I brought out my offer letter with both of our signatures on it and they started backpedaling. They said they would talk and get back to me. I made it very clear that if I did not receive the agreed upon amount, we would have a problem. Fast forward to two weeks later, new management invites me into their offices I'm offered a 6% raise. They try to make excuses about budget restrictions, fairness to other employees, whatever they could think of. I knew then I had these options. Quit, demand the 15%, possibly get it, but severely damage my relationship with new management, or accept the 6% raise and maintain a strong, positive relationship with new management, allowing me to blindside them later. The wheels in my mind spinning, I agree to the 6% raise. At that moment, I decided what I would do. I would take the raise, use the remainder of my time there to look for another job, and leave. A few months passed, though, and my plan expanded. I began implementing the most cutting-edge technology, using the most modern frameworks, upgrading everything I could as aggressively as I could. Of course, this provided immense benefit to the company. That was the plan. I entrenched myself in every system in every way possible, increased the skill floor for my position as high as I could get it, and left. Four months after I accepted the raise of 6%, I accepted an offer for a salary of $130,000 at another company. I put my two weeks notice in at the company, and all hell broke loose. New management knew they'd messed up, and they were completely blindsided that I was unhappy with my position. Since I had graciously accepted the 6%, they thought they were off the hook. With me, I took all the knowledge of almost every one of their systems. New management freaked out. So I did what any capitalist would do. I offered to come back as a remote contractor for $200 an hour. They had no choice but to accept. So over the last few months, I've been charging them $200 an hour to do the exact same thing that I was previously doing for significantly less. Now, instead of being out a few thousand dollars a year due to my raise, They've been out over $35,000 in a few months with no end in sight. I even hired one of my good friends to help fill the hours. The money's nice, but the look on new management's faces when this played out was priceless. It was the sweetest revenge of my life. And our next story, public holiday shifts. I worked at a place for many years as a cook. My company did catering and cleaning for their facility, after three years, I was finally offered permanent part-time, but the condition would be four of my shifts every fortnight would be cleaning. I wasn't too keen on it, but I said I would give it a go. After my first two cleaning shifts, it just wasn't for me. I couldn't handle the smells of the feces, urine, vomit, blood, so my boss said, that's fine, but now you've lost those four shifts because he couldn't be bothered to tweak the roster before he released it as it was being released later that day which meant I was losing out on four public holiday rate shifts. Public holiday rates for us was about $40 an hour. My coworkers and I had been working together for years and we were all good friends. They said how much it sucked for me losing out on all those shifts. I mentioned to them that they could let me know if they wanted me to do any shifts for them so they could have family time. And they all said, no way, I'm not giving up any of my shifts. This is a you problem, not an us problem and bits and pieces after that about how I was just going to have to deal with not having any money, and I overheard them talking about how rude I was for even suggesting it. Fair enough, I guess. Anyway, the revenge part. As it started getting closer and closer to the holidays and their family started to make plans, suddenly everyone started asking me if I could cover their shifts. I said, no, sorry, I've made plans for those days now, and they would reply with, Come on, man, you said it'd be okay if we asked, and my family's coming from town far away, and no one else can cover them. I would shrug and reply with, 
Sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. Sorry. Did it to three different people who were complaining about me behind my back when the original conversation happened. Yeah, I could have used the money, but it was the best four days off I ever had. And our last story. My neighbor gets what she deserves. So this happened last week, and I'm proud of myself for it. I'm English, so I'll spell mom as mum. During this pandemic, I've found peace by sitting in my garden watching YouTube videos and scrolling Reddit. I always sit in my swing chair. A swing chair is a chair mixed with a swing, so you sit and swing without annoying chains or having to go out. My swing chair has been through a lot, so much so to the point where if you sit on it, it squeaks a bit. I like the squeaks, though, so I keep using it. My neighbor hates my family. Ever since my mom, my brother and I moved into my now stepdad's house. She especially hates me for some reason. One day my parents got the day off from work so we were all home. I was out on the swing chair listening to music using headphones. All of a sudden a bucket gets thrown over the fence and almost hit me. I jumped and took off my headphones and asked, who did that? My neighbor responded with, stop swinging on your chair. You're distracting my children and making them jealous. Either stop or give it to me. I asked, how am I distracting them? She replied with, that sound makes them look through the hole they made in the fence. I said that I'll stop. Here's the malicious compliance. I stopped going on my swing chair and instead picked up an old hobby of mine, drumming. I played it so much that my family would sometimes have to speak louder to talk to me. This is where it gets weird though. She then phoned my personal phone that I've never given the number to anyone except my close friends. Apparently, she'd gone to my mom's Facebook, searched for a pic of me and my friends, found my best friend's number by some means, and posed as my aunt asking for my number so she could check up on me. She called me, yelling at me to stop drumming. I said, why? And she said, because of the noise. I said that she said that I had to stop swinging, so I took up a hobby. She hung up. I now go on my swing chair, play drums, and play drums with my brother on his guitar. Revenge is best served cold. That's not normal behavior from a neighbor. You don't know what else she might try to pull. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video, and I'll see you in the next one.